I'm excited about the word. How many persons in the house? Amen. You're ready for the word. Shout, I'm ready. Shout, I'm ready for the word. Amen. The word of the Lord. Amen. We'll find our attention. Amen. In the book of Romans, the 12th chapter, we're going to begin reading at verse number one. Amen. We do say God bless and we say praise the Lord to everybody in the household of faith on today. Amen. Certainly we count it the privilege and the honor. Amen. To be found in the household of faith one more time. Amen. And there is a word from the Lord. Amen. For your life on today. Amen. And if you came with an appetite, there is food at the table. Amen. How many persons in the house you're excited about the word? Amen. Bless the Lord. Oh, my soul. Amen. The word of the Lord. Amen. Finds us on today in Romans, the 12th chapter. We're going to begin reading at verse number one, a very, very familiar passage of scripture. Amen. But we're going to squeeze that passage one more time. Amen. Glory to his name. If you have it, shout it out by saying, I have it. It's on screen for those of you who desire, amen, to follow alongside with us as, as well. Romans 12 and 1, it reads as such, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove or test what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Amen. May the Lord add a blessing, amen, to the reading of his word that we may grow and be sanctified thereby. We want to draw our thought from verse number two. Verse number two says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye what? Transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. That she may be what? Prove. What is that what? Good. Acceptable. And here it is. Perfect. Everybody shout perfect. Perfect will of God. Amen. We want to use for a topic for the next few moments. If it's not perfect, keep working it. Amen. I said if it's not perfect, keep working it. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Beloved of God, amen. We have an awesome opportunity on today to receive from the and glean from the word of God. Amen. And on today, amen, the Holy Ghost has sent us into this house, amen, to inform everyone, amen, that transformation, amen, is necessary, amen, and the transformation must be our rightful next step, amen. The Bible says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye what? Transformed. Everybody shout transform. Amen. Now, beloved of God, transformation is not a punchline. And sometimes, amen, we think about transformation in the terms of a punchline. Amen. It sounds like the right thing to say, but in essence, amen, when we're actually walking out our everyday lives, amen, we are not engaged in transformation in the manner and the fashion wherein we ought to. Beloved of God, transformation is a process. Everybody shout process. It's not a punchline, it is a process, amen. And when transformation comes, amen, to the forefront, amen, the question that will often come up first in our minds and our spirit is why change? The next question that will come is often, how much is this gonna cost me to change? And the last question usually is, is it actually worth the change? Amen. And we talked about this briefly on last week or maybe a long time, depending on how you see it. Amen. People are generally uncomfortable with change. Amen. And we indicated that people become uncomfortable with change because they fear the unknown. They fear a loss of control. And there is a loss of control. Amen. People are uncomfortable because their habits and comforts have to change. People become uncomfortable with change because of a fear of failure. People become uncomfortable with change because oftentimes they are so attached to the past. People become uncomfortable with change because of social pressures. People become uncomfortable with change because there's often a lack of resources. People become uncomfortable with change 
because of their past negative experiences and trauma and all of these things be begin to become really high mountains, barriers and stumbling blocks Amen. When it comes to this whole notion of transformation and change, amen, and these questions, amen, about change begins to oppress me and I become anxious about it because I'm more comfortable staying the way I am rather than changing. These factors, amen, sometimes they combine forces to create some significant barrier to embracing change even when as we stated on last week sometimes change is so obvious is it's clear that it's necessary that things must change but because we have become so oppressed by all the things that we have to tackle because we have to change amen we choose not to change when we know it is the right thing to do. I ain't got no help, but I wish I had three amens, even though I said the same thing last week. Amen. amen. I'm going to say it again. Amen. Family life isn't working. Finances aren't working. Health isn't working. You're physically, mentally unhealthy. And here's the big one. There's a spiritual lack of health as well. And we know that there are things that needs to happen in our lives so that we can make some progress in the next direction. We need to be going uphill, not downhill. Amen. But we refuse refuse to change amen oftentimes because we feel the pressure of all of these barriers amen and i want to say to the congregation on today that a refusal to change is essentially an agreement to quit amen but god hasn't called us to be quitters amen but essentially sometimes we have already quit when we refuse to change subconsciously something has already triggered in our minds and although we're still showing up we've actually already quit on the assignment amen because so many persons are anti-change subconsciously or consciously they are quitting on their family they are quitting on their desire for financial security they are quitting on their health they are quitting on their physical health their mental health and the big one is a whole lot of folk have quit on their spiritual health they are determining within their mind that this is going to cause too much too much shift has to happen in order for me to get healthy in this state so essentially I'm going to choose to stay the way I am even though I know I'm on the path to destruction but I came to push the congregation on today and to challenge you to resist that spirit resist the devil that's what the bible says and he will begin to what not only back up it says he will flee which means he'll take off my god he'll take off like uh-huh one of those track and field stars that i saw uh -huh, back in the olympics he, he, he'll get out of there real fast if you just start to say no 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 beloved this is not what's going to happen in my life i need about seven folk to just get in agreement with me on today and there's going to be a whole miracle in the house I, I, I refuse to, amen to quit amen but some folk aren't saying I quit what they're saying is I won't change and I'm saying to you that your refusal to change is the same thing as you saying I quit I, 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 I wish I had a, a church that would pray with me on today amen glory to it let's lean in a little bit on today on this spiritual health dynamic amen one of the most deceptive things that could ever happen to you is for you to be persuaded that the root of your matter is not spiritual oftentimes the enemy tries to persuade us that our problems aren't spiritual problems he presents amen our problems to something as as if it's something that's within the framework of what we see with our eyes but the bible teaches us that we do not wrestle with flesh and blood we don't wrestle in the physical but the 
actual fight. The wrestle is with spiritual powers, wickedness in high places, principalities and powers that shine to crumble and collapse your life, beloved. You're in spiritual warfare. I know, I, I know that's not the part that you wanted to hear, but everything that's going on in your mind and in your life with your family, all the things that you're going through on your job and in your community, everything that's happening in your finances, in, in your mental well, even your physical life, all of those things are attributed to the fact that there is spiritual warfare that you are wrestling up against. So instead of trying to wrestle in the natural, you don't need to get on the phone with your girlfriend. You don't have you don't need to have a conversation even with you don't need to have a conversation with the neighbor that's on your road. What you need to do is to go to God in prayer, beloved of God, because this war that's happening in your life, it will not be one in the natural it will be one on your knees in fasting and in sacrifice and in prayer that's the part for me I need seven folk that's all I, I know everybody ain't going to get with me on today but if I had seven folk that would just agree with the fact that heaven is speaking over this house on today beloved it's spiritual it is uh, 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 Proverbs 14 and 34 it says righteousness exalts a nation mm -hmm. but sin is a reproach to any people uh -huh. it's, it's, it's spiritual it's a matter of righteousness and wickedness uh -huh. let me explain let, let, let me unpack that a little bit godly principles causes you to prosper personal desires causes you to collapse let me say that one more time i said godly principles will cause you to prosper whereas your personal desires will cause you to collapse every institution organization infrastructure this same principle applies if you do it God's way, you'll win. If you do it your way, you'll lose. You might not lose today, but the day is coming where defeat is your portion. Uh, and if you do it God's way, you, it may look like you're not. It may look like. I said look like because you're winning right now. It may look like you're not winning today, but in the future, it's going to be obvious that you're more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus our Lord uh, let, 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 me, let me unpack that a little bit more let, let me explain if you mismanage your family by not engaging your family in a way that is consistent with his word eventually it's going to burn you uh, uh, I said in a way that's consistent with his what? Word. with his word I got two people listening amen God bless you in a way that is consistent with his word. His word says, train up the child in the way that he should go. It didn't say let the child be a child. It didn't say let boys be boys. <laughs> it didn't say let children be children. It says train them in the way that he should go. Uh -huh. That's what the word says. But that, uh, look how <laughs> look at your faces. Amen. That's the part that you didn't want to hear. I didn't come to scold you. But if you train him the way the word said do it, you will have success uh -huh, be manifested in the life of that child yes I got no amens uh -huh, the bible says this it says seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of its what righteousness it didn't say seek you first your family and all of its pleasures it says if you put God even above your family that your whole family will come in alignment with the God that's on the inside of you 
It's, it's hard in here today. I love the hard part, though. I love it. It says, this is what the Bible says about your family. Uh huh. This is what the Word says about your family. It says, love them that despitefully use you. Ah. Y'all didn't want to clap. Y'all was clapping. <laughs> Why y'all not clapping right there? It says love them. It didn't say go to war with them. It didn't say cut them off. It didn't say don't forgive them. It didn't say be bitter towards them. It said to love them even when they despitefully, which means I'm doing it on purpose now. Oh, that's the part for me. Now, if you if you if you treat me wrong and it was just a, a misstep, uh, that's one thing. But if you're trying uh, to take advantage of me on purpose, oh, that, that I mean, it takes a lot of spiritual maturation now for me to get over the fact that you are trying uh, to take me for a joke. And your instinct is fight them back in the flesh. No, that's not how you deal with your family. You deal with your family on your knees. Yes. If you do it God's way, you got to have enough faith to know that I'm going to what? Win. If you do it your way, you will lose eventually your sons and your daughters aren't going to want a relationship with you because you didn't do it God's way eventually your family is going to just keep leeching off of you and they'll never be independent because you made them always dependent on you because you didn't do it God oh this stuff you didn't do it God's way. Oh man, I'm losing the crowd. Help, Holy Ghost. Help us tonight, Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Pray right here. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm losing my crowd. My God. If you do it God's way, if you have enough faith to do it His way, you will win. But if you keep leaning on your flesh, what your mind is telling you, you're going to lose. You're going to lose. You're going to be, oh, never mind. Let me go to the next one because I've already lost two thirds. I don't want to lose the last third. I got seven folks still praying and I'm pushing them seven real hard. Uh huh. Uh huh. One day you're going to be in a whole domestic violent situation because you didn't learn to do what the Word of God said to do with your family, which is to love them even though they are using you. And you're going to try to get back with what? Your carnal flesh and blood. You're going to try to get physical in a situation that's spiritual. So you have to allow the word to what? Direct your paths. Let, let, me, let me explain it like this. If you mismanage, oh Jesus. If you mismanage your finances, by not engaging your finances in a way that is consistent with his word, eventually, maybe not today, but eventually it will burn you. Because the Bible teaches us how to manage our finances. It says, oh no man but to love him. It says the borrower is a slave to the lender. It says bring your tithe, your first and your best to the storehouse so the hole that's in your pocket may be mended. I'm trying to help you survive, beloved. Don't you want to win? My God. Proverbs 21 and 20 says it like this. It says, precious treasure 
and oil are in a wise man's dwelling but a foolish man devours it which means that there are resources that are coming our way but the enemy will get in your spirit you will look at your neighbor and you would say I need to have the same thing my neighbor has and you will spend and devour everything that God has put in your hand all the anointing all the oil all the resource all the intelligence you just devoured everything and when the groom comes you're going to be amongst the five foolish with no oil no oil because you consumed everything as if tomorrow wasn't coming you consumed everything that came into your bank account as if it's getting ready to change your life for the better you look good today but tomorrow I ain't even gonna see you and then you're gonna have to deal with the fact that you blew $1,000 on that outfit that you did not have now it ain't that wrong with blowing a thousand dollars on the outfit if you got ten thousand but you spent one thousand on the outfit and you got four hundred oh, alright let me uh, where those seven folk at seven I still got seven <laughs> I got six <laughs> oh, somebody say help us Lord okay let's keep going let me explain if you mismanage your health then you're going to lose the bible teaches us about moderation gluttony and it teaches us that our body is the temple of the lord I mean after seven hot dogs you have to come to a place where you're saying to yourself the holy ghost ought to speak to you after number seven and said you know what you're pushing this further than it ought to go. It really should have happened at five. Probably three. Probably the second one was sufficient. <laughs> I said that that's spiritual because why would it be in the word that gluttony is what? A deadly sin if God didn't want us to manage our bodies as the temple of the Lord which means that I can't do the assignment that's on my life if I'm mismanaging the God that lives on the inside of me by destroying my temple that's spiritual I promise you I'm not teasing you. The reason why you are abusing your body in this manner is because something spiritual is going on inside of you and you're trying to find satisfaction and comfort in a place where you ought to be replacing that desire for satisfaction and comfort in God. Somebody say help us Holy Ghost let me explain family if you mismanage your ministry mm -hmm. and we talked about ministry on last week now for those of you who are following me we talked about the fact that ministry is what you have been called on earth to do everybody has a ministry and the church said amen, amen. you don't have to have the mic to have a ministry your ministry is the reason why you exist your ministry is the purpose for your life ministry is the unique thing that only you can do the way you do it ministry is your gift to the world in which you exist ministry is your selfless act of service to provide the solution to the problem that only you can fix that's your ministry uh, and, and if you mismanage it and it's possible for you to do so you're going to find that you're going to lead a life that is unfulfilled and empty and broken and void so, so Paul speaks about this necessity to manage the thing that God has placed in my life he says I discipline my body 
I keep it under control lest after all of my preaching I myself should be a castaway and disqualify Paul with all of his ministry accomplishments all of the anointing that was obvious and evident on his life he still was praying to God to keep him under subjection because he knew that if I don't pray and fast my body my natural man my carnal man will move out of relationship with God and ultimately not only will my natural life perish but my spiritual man will perish as well we came to live on today somebody ought to shake yourself and says I'm coming out of this state of death I'm moving forward in victory I'm going to abide by the word of God and I'm going to live and not die now family shout hallelujah let me say this spirit filled persons are designed to be the most healthy people on the face of the earth because when you are spirit filled that means that you're more apt more inclined and more capable of making the necessary changes in your life and, and I know it, it, this feels like uh, it may feel like a pressure oriented statement but when you have the Holy Ghost which is the spirit of God living on the inside of you once you've been saved, redeemed and restored the spirit of God should be operating you in you in such a manner that you can be transformed because if you can't be transformed then that ain't your spirit the Bible says they had a form of godliness but they did not the power thereof and the power of God is the power to change I'm this way today but the power of God gives me the capacity to be another way on tomorrow a way that's more like God the God in me should give me the capacity and I know y'all don't like this part it should give me the capacity to stop backbiting Amen. to stop gossiping Amen. to stop lying Amen. to stop cheating Amen. and to stop stealing that, that, the, the, the spirit of God I have power operating on the inside of me so I should have the healthiest family I got four. You was one of the four. I said I should have the healthiest family with the Holy Ghost living inside of me. Because I have the power to change my family. When do we lose power over the enemy? When do we lose power as spirit? I'm talking to the believers specifically now. At what point did we lose power to transform every space that we step into? When did we lose the power? At what point did we lose the ability to change our financial situation? Spirit-filled persons ought to be the most healthy financially than anybody else on the face of the earth. I didn't say you got to be a millionaire. I said you're healthy financially, which means you live within the framework of your means. That's all you got to do. Oh, this a hard. Oh, this, this. But you said you had the Holy Ghost. I don't think Jesus would be running around here with $180,000 in debt. But I got his spirit. So what, 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 what is this? Am I Abba Father? Is he my father or not? Well, I got to get this education, man. I need, uh, you can get your education without it. Uh, it's getting real. It's getting real ratchet in here. <laughs> I think this crowd get ready to start throwing stuff at me. I said, you still can get your education. There's a way to apply yourself in a way. That you don't have to collapse your life in a manner that's not God honoring. You should be the most healthy 
person in your physical and your mental and your spiritual state with the Holy Ghost. It's time, uh huh, because I'm, I'm talking to a real spirit filled crowd. It's time for those spirit filled persons to be pressed to do more than sing and shout and dance. It's time to press you to get healthy in your finances, in your family, in your physical body. Why are we not healthy? Because we're not leaning on the word of God. It's time for the addictions in your life to be broken. I wish I, I could say it another way. It's time for the addictions to be broken. And what you have to do to break the addictions, you have to be not conformed to this world. But you have to be what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, we need to be not just religious, but we need to be spiritual. Now, the Bible says it like this in John 15 and 8. It says, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you. That, that's the critical part. It says, if my word is on the inside of you, which means that it's doing more than just coming off of your mouth. It's in your spirit. The word of God is being applied in my life. It's more than a cliche. I'm living out the word of God in every context of my life. The word of the God, of the living God, will bring us to a place of great victory. Total victory. When the word of God abides in you, this is what the Bible promises. It says, whatsoever you ask, it shall be done unto you. Woo! It got to be done. Because the power of God is operating on the inside of you. Somebody shout, it shall be done. Now, here it is, family. This is the role of spiritual. This is the reason why you have spiritual leadership. Your spiritual leadership is to show you what's possible. You know who your spiritual leader ultimately is? Jesus Christ. He is the example. He is our heir in God. Once we have been filled with his spirit, we are adopted, we are engrafted into the family and Jesus Christ is our spiritual leader. He shows us what we have the power to do. So that's why the Bible says greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world and that's why Jesus said greater works than these shall you do shall you do where is our greater works it says greater works than these shall you do because you have leadership and that's really the role of all spiritual leadership. Your spiritual leadership is to show you what's possible. You are to see the God in your leader. And when you stop seeing God in your leader, you need another leader or you need to fix your eyes. But something got to change. Everybody shout, change. Did y'all catch that? If you stop seeing God in your spiritual leadership, you need another leader. Or you need to fix your vision. But either way, something has to change. Somebody shout glory. You need to see God in your leader because... The Bible says, let your light so shine before men 
that they may see your what? Good works. They need to say that the people that's following you and the people that you're following, you need to see the goodness of God in operation in them. Why? So they may glorify your Father which is in heaven. If God ain't getting no glory out of your leadership or your personal life, something has to what? Change. The Bible says this about spiritual leadership. It says, let him be an example to the flock. Not to lord over God's heritage, which means that he ain't about to be your God. But he's about to be your guide in the sense that he's giving you a framework for what's possible for those that follow God. So that he can be able to flee, feed the flock with a what? Ready mind. Y'all catch that? It says a ready mind. When your spirit is broken, how can you feed people with a ready mind because you're not ready because you're always distracted by your brokenness that's the role of spiritual leadership he ought to be she ought to be always ready so that you can learn to be always ready you ain't got to get ready I stay ready. Woo! Come on, put your hand on yourself. I know you ain't there yet. And don't lie, but we speaking prophetically. Say, I ain't got to get ready. Oh, I said, say it. I ain't got to get ready. I stay ready. Put a praise right there. God ain't called me to be no raggedy pastor. And some folks think that having a raggedy spiritual leader is some sign of virtue. My pastor is always in a scandal. He's always in sin. He got a broken family. He got broken finances. He got premature health crises. He have emotional breakdowns, but he loves God. That's not for me. I said that's not for me it's not for you either what your testimony should be about your spiritual leadership is that my leadership is blessed it should come as no surprise that the one in leadership has an amazing family plenty of money fit to the bits physically mentally spiritually crushing it Ain't that what the young folks say? Or, 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 do, they say do they still say crushing it? Am I behind the times? I don't think so. <laughs> what do they say? Uh, they say something. Uh, uh, they, you, you, you're doing well. Let's go back just to the old school. You should be doing well in every area and it should come as no surprise that you are well in all of these areas. It ain't no virtue to have some broken down leader the virtue is in having someone stand before you in leadership that you can say wow I would like to have a family like that wow I would have like to have my finances in order like that wow I would like a hunt to be a fit physically mentally and spiritually like that so that you can have something to what strive after because if the blind are leading the blind we're both ending up where in the ditch you need to stop following folk that ain't doing nothing even if it's me if there is no productivity you need to shift because I ain't called to lose I'm called to win and I need to be on a winning team oh come on family we need to stop 
settling for defeat for we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus our Lord we need to stop settling for less when God has called us to be the head and not the tail we need to stop saying to ourselves that we can't cast the devil out of our house out of our finances out of our body the devil is a liar we gotta get bold enough to go forward and say I am above it's no virtue in your pastor walking around with holes in his shoes and celebrate oh he really loves God I didn't say he couldn't be but that is not what God is calling us to be and to do as the most broke down, tore down folk on the face of the earth. God is calling us to greater. Everybody shout greater. greater. Beloved of God, if you do it God's way, you're going to win. If you do it your way, you're going to lose because righteousness, what? Exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Oh, glory to his name. So what the text is teaching us on today is that a change of mind is a change of spirit. You need to have a spiritual transplant on today. And the Bible teaches us in Romans 12 about this. It says, don't you be conformed to this world, but you are to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And this change of mind comes with a change of spirit. And this change of spirit happens with an embrace and an intimacy with the word of God. So when Paul was speaking to the Romans about this transformation, he was saying, this is contingent on your obedience. And, ooh, oh, that's a dirty word. Oh, my goodness. That's just ratchet to just cuss in church. <laughs> to say obedience in the house of God. I mean, I, would, I, I wouldn't be mad if you just walked out right now. I just, I really wouldn't be, because y'all not be cussing in church like that. Amen. Saying obedience. Yeah. Ooh, ooh, submit. Somebody said even a dirtier word. It's getting real ratchet in here. All right. Obedience to the gospel received requires a decisive dedication which is where the word sacrifice comes from. Holiness of life will not progress apart from deliberative acts of the will. Sanctification is gradual in the sense that it continues throughout life, but holiness, everybody shout holiness. Holiness advances dependent upon a decision of the will. Everybody shout decisions of the will. For example, Sundays off for church. That's a decision of the will. Uh, uh, for example, I'm going to spend based on a budget. That's a decision of the will. Uh, saying I'm throwing the cigarettes, the liquor, the porn in the trash. That's a decision of the will. Uh, uh, another example, I'm blocking you on my social media. I'm deleting your phone number. That's a decision of the will. And holiness will only advance when there is a decision of of the will. You got to get strong enough to say that this is it. I'm putting this in the trash can. I'm putting this underneath the power of God. And until you have a decision that you have deliberately done, that you have intentionally done, then there will be no progress, no process of transformation in your life. You got to get deliberate about it and go forward because you made up your mind I'm ready for transformation to hit my life and the Bible says that these kind of sacrifices they are holy and pleasing
pleasing to God. They are worthy of his acceptance. This is the sacrifice that's a living sacrifice. What makes it a living sacrifice is because this reflects the voluntary nature of the act. I'm still alive, but I'm sacrificing myself. I still have a desire, but I'm sacrificing myself. I get to the place and to the point where I'm saying, not my will, but thine will be done. I'm offering my body as a living sacrifice in a spiritual act of worship. My worship is due to the fact that I've come to a relationship and a rational decision in view of God's mercies on my life. That this is a reasonable choice. This is the right choice. It's entirely fitting that I commit myself without any reservation at all because he is a Lord of all. He's a Lord over my whole life and if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. So if I don't give him everything I cannot be in relationship with him at all. So I want to squeeze uh -huh, on my Lord. I want to grab a hold on to him. I want to cling to him with everything that's in me and I'm not going to allow this world to squeeze me outside of the mold of God. I'm not going to allow this world to pull me out. There is a pressure that's trying to get me to trash uh -huh, the God that's on the inside of me. The customs and the culture of this world is trying to pull me out of relationship with God. But I have made Jesus my choice and there's getting ready to be real change and this change is going to come because I have decided to reject all of this worldly influences that comes from within and without. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided that there is no other way. In other words, I have decided that God has to get the glory out of my life. I'm out of this world and I'm into God. My heart and my mind is surrendered to him. Yes, I understand now everything that I see is just temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. I don't see it with my natural eyes, but my spirit is giving God a yes. So I'm getting ready to release myself from this world and I'm going to surrender to the will of God because I trust him enough to believe that there will be glory out of this after this I know that it's going to be difficult to change I know that folk are going to look at me strange uh -huh, but I'm going to be in God's will and you will find that when you get in God's will God will find you good and pleasing and pursuing perfection and as long as you're pursuing after God there's getting ready to be a transformation that's getting ready to shift every reality in your life and I'm excited about it on today that everything is changing for me my life is getting ready to go up yes everything is getting ready to go up I ain't gotta wait for the battle to be over I'm gonna send my praise up right now I wish I had somebody that didn't have to wait for it but you can praise God for it in advance some things are getting ready to shift I'm getting ready to be a champion I'm in training right now but when the Olympics come I'm gonna cross that line first I'm gonna win my crown I'm gonna hear well done son thou good and faithful servant I'm gonna make it to that city called heaven and after all of this I'll be singing I'll be dancing I'll be shouting I'll be rejoicing all of this won't be nothing at all it's only a test that you're going through I said it's only a test it's going to be over real soon sooner or later family it's going to turn in your favor don't you give up you better lift up those hands and say I'm getting ready to fight for it I'm getting ready to press in I'm getting ready to pursue don't you allow the 
pressures of life to shift your mind shout yes Lord I got a reason to change everybody standing in the house I have a reason to change I have a reason to change so when that first question comes up why change my answer to the enemy is that what I'm doing will not work it's not that it's not working now is that it will not work ever it will not ever work so when I am confronted with the enemy's inquiries why are you changing I have an answer and I stand in faith and boldness and confidence because I have a relationship with God what I'm doing now will never work and there's somebody in this house you know that what you're doing now there's no possibility for future success it will not work and I'm not going to allow the enemy to get me to sell out for a momentary pleasure for something that won't work for my future my eyes are on the heels from whence cometh my help I'm not getting ready to sacrifice the vision and the mission that's on my life for nobody or no thing and the enemy is trying to confront you with why change you need to get back in his face and say I'm changing because the Holy Ghost told me the spirit of Christ has informed me that what I'm doing will never work so why would I continue for what it won't work I came to win somebody shout hallelujah, hallelujah. the next question that you're going to have to wrestle with is how much is this going to cost me and the answer is plain family it's going to cost <laughs> a living sacrifice you know what a living sacrifice is? A sacrifice that you feel. A sacrifice is that thing that you desire that has to be placed on the altar. A living sacrifice is a surrendered heart and mind. My will is surrendered. My mind is made up. I understand that it's going to cost me there's some pain in the process. <laughs> oh, y'all didn't want to hear about pain. You want to hear about blessings. The blessing comes out of the pain. There's pain in the process. But you got to put something on the altar. And you got to let go and let God. Somebody shout hallelujah. And then the last question is, is it worth it? This living sacrifice that I need to make. This sacrifice was just going to cost me some, some friends. It's going to cause me some pleasure. It's going to cause me a little grief. It's going to cost me to lose some things. So is there going to be a return on this investment in God? And the answer is yes. Is it worth it? It is good. Because it brings about moral and spiritual growth. Yeah, y'all didn't want to hear about Y'all just wanted me to say spiritual growth. That's ambiguous. Moral growth. Spiritual growth. Which means that all those natural areas in your life is submitted to God in a God-honoring way. Yes, I got to preach it this way. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Your family needs to be submitted to God. Your finances need to be submitted to God. 
your health needs to be submitted to God. Everything in your life needs to be submitted to God. It's good because it's going to allow you to grow. It's good because it's pleasing to God. Because it is an expression of his nature. It is good because this dedication to God will lead to, here it is family, well done. Enter into the joy of the Lord. I want to challenge every person in this house to put that imagination in your spirit. Hearing our Father which art in heaven saying, enter into the joy of the Lord. When you hear that, how would you respond? On the count of three, let's let it go. One, two, and three. Glory. Come on, praise him. That's all you're going to do? When you hear God say, enter, into the joy of the Lord, I think I'll leap, hallelujah. I think I'll run, hallelujah. I think I'll scream, hallelujah. I think I'll pour out my worship. I think I'll say, Lord, I praise you. I think I'll say, Lord, I thank you. Glory, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. I think I will bless the Lord. Yes. What a mighty God. What a mighty God. Hallelujah. Hands are lifted. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. Save heal and deliver father i pray for the one that's in need of salvation on today i pray that with that lifted hand that they receive the baptism of the holy ghost for that hand that is lifted and you haven't received the endowment of his spirit you may be asking what must i do to be saved because i want to hear well done lift that hand all over this house the Bible says it like this, and this is what we believe. We believe that repentance is necessary for salvation. Repentance means that everything that's against God's will, I'm stopping, I'm turning, I'm running. I'm stopping the thing that's not of God. I'm turning away from it, and I'm running into God as Lord of my life. The Bible says repentance is necessary for salvation. With that hand lifted, if you desire to receive salvation lift that hand and repent right now we believe that repentance is necessary for salvation we believe that baptism is necessary for salvation everybody shout baptism now baptism we need to understand what baptism is baptism is not just getting wet in water baptism is death to the old me and life in christ once you're ready to die to you and to live in Christ, he's ready to baptize you right now in the Holy Ghost. The baptism of the Holy Ghost is the, is the endowment of his spirit. You're getting, getting ready to live in Christ. We believe that repentance is necessary. Baptism is necessary for salvation. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. With that hand lifted hand, as high to the heavens as you can get it, let's receive the holy ghost all over the house the bible says that they were in one place on one accord don't you want to enter into the joy of the lord the bible says they were in one place on one accord awaiting the reception the promise of his spirit there came a sound from oh god i wish i had a, a a church that had faith on today that god could do it again right now it says there came a sound from heaven like a rush and a mighty wind filled all the house cloven tongues as a fire sat down on each of them they began to speak and to glorify god somebody shall holy ghost fall in the house say my brother say my sister things aren't perfect so we are still at work 
but the work begins with the Holy Ghost save in this house that hand that is lifted give them faith enough to receive the gift of God in the name of Jesus Christ heal God and deliver let the people of God shout it out say in Jesus name now bless my brother bless my sister as only you can come on and give God glory for it